Since the very inception of military aviation, the United States has invested heavily into fielding game-changing military aircraft that leverage cutting-edge technologies to provide a tactical or strategic edge over the nation's competitors. But for every one F-117 Nighthawk or B-2 Spirit or F-22 Raptor, there's a whole bunch of programs that get left on the scrap heap. Sometimes these efforts don't make the cut because they're just too forward-leaning or too expensive, but other times, they're just the right jet at the wrong time. Let's talk about Uncle Sam's game-changing aircraft that got canceled before they could change the game. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. It's no secret that the United States places a massive emphasis on air power, but a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. has led the world in air power since its very inception. While there were a number of notable earlier efforts, the Wright brothers are widely seen as the first to achieve any kind of real success with a powered, heavier-than-air flying machine, starting in 1903 in the skies over Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. But what fewer people know is just six years later, the U.S. Army came calling, purchasing the world's first military aircraft, the Wright Military Flyer, in 1909. By 1912, Colonel Isaac Lewis and Captain Charles DeForest Chandler became the first aviators ever to perform a gun run when they mounted a 25-pound machine gun onto the footrest of one of the Army signal school's right type B flyers and started making passes at a six foot by seven foot cheesecloth they hung up as a target. And it definitely didn't stop there. The list of American firsts in air power is extensive. From the first air-to-air -air refueling, to the first pressurized cabin in a bomber, to the first supersonic jet, to the first supersonic bomber, to the first hypersonic aircraft, to the first stealth aircraft, and the list goes on and on. But the truth is, you can never tell which technologies are going to define the next era of warfare. And as a result, maintaining that dominant edge in air power has required broad investment into a number of different efforts aimed at developing or maturing a number of different types of technologies. Some of these programs produce technologies that literally redefine the way air power is perceived and leveraged by nations all across the globe, while others end up on the shelf, either because their technology was just too expensive to pursue in volume or because the problems that they solved weren't the problems America was prioritizing at the time. You'll often hear people say these days that if you look at the most advanced aircraft in service, the real technology the DoD has tucked behind the classified veil is 10 or 30 years further ahead. And while this is usually said to suggest that the U.S. has secret flying saucers tucked away at Area 51 or something, the truth is, this premise is fairly sound. It just doesn't manifest the way most people might think. It helps to think of these cutting-edge aircraft programs as smartphones. When a new iPhone hits the market, it is not full of the latest and most advanced telecommunications technology on the planet. Instead, it's full of components that Apple knows are reliable enough to last as long as the phone needs to last, perform well enough to do what the phone needs to do, and are cheap enough to produce in volume and sell at a price that the consumer will buy. And while it may seem crazy for incredibly expensive programs like the F-35, advanced aircraft aren't much different. Performance and capability are obviously vital considerations, but so are reliability and cost. In other words, there are sure to be technologies that are far more advanced than those being fielded in the F-35 or even the NGAD fighter, but until those technologies become reliable and cheap enough to be fielded in large volume, these efforts get put on the shelf. Likewise, there are also programs that would offer genuinely new capabilities at costs that we may be able to stomach, but if they don't fill a current gap in America's overall strategic positioning, these programs also get put on the shelf until Uncle Sam sees a pressing need for them. You just can't fund everything all the time, even with the world's biggest defense budget. 
So with that in mind, let's talk about seven of these aviation programs that could have not just redefined air power in their era, but likely even today, as well as why these programs ultimately got put on the shelf. And we'll start with Boeing's X-20 Dinosaur. Born out of Germany's World War II efforts to create a bomber that could attack New York and continue on to the Pacific, Boeing's X-20 Dinosaur was to be a single-seat craft boosted into the sky atop American rockets. That's right, in the 1950s, the Dinosaur would have been the world's first hypersonic bomber. In fact, the dinosaur was very similar in both concept and intended execution to China's fractional orbital bombardment system that drew headlines the world over after a successful test back in 2021, despite the X-20 program predating the launch of Sputnik. So it's safe to say this effort was a fair bit ahead of its time. After launch, the X-20 would soar along the blurred line between Earth's atmosphere and the vacuum of space, literally bouncing along the heavens by using a lifting body design and hypersonic speeds to skip along the upper reaches of the atmosphere. It would circle the globe, releasing its payload over Soviet targets literally miles below, before making its way back to American territory to come in for a gliding landing, not entirely unlike the space shuttle would decades later. The X-20 was a 1950s science fiction fever dream born out of the nuclear age and the earliest days of the Cold War. But according to experts at the time, it very likely would have worked. By 1960, the space plane's overall design was largely settled, leveraging a delta wing shape and small winglets for control in place of a traditional tail. In order to manage the incredible heat of re-entry, the X-20 would use super alloys like the heat-resistant Rene 41 in its frame, with graphite and zirconia rods used for heat shielding on the underside of the aircraft. Now, this wasn't just a paper plane. This was a real developmental concept. In fact, it was so promising that in 1960, the Pentagon tapped a group of elite service personnel to crew this suborbital hypersonic bomber. Among this group was a then 30-year-old Navy test pilot and aeronautical engineer named Neil Armstrong. Of course, Armstrong would go on to leave the program two years later for even greater heights as a part of NASA's Gemini and Apollo programs. And Armstrong's departure was a real sign of things to come. You see, after the launch of Sputnik, the U.S. had a bit of a freakout. In fact, these days we remember it as the Sputnik Crisis. At the time, it not only appeared that the Soviet Union had secured the ultimate high ground, but it also really looked as though their communist model had managed to field technology that no capitalist nation could match. Obviously, the U.S. wanted to address both of these narratives, so programs like the X-20 were canceled in favor of reallocating their funds and resources toward new space ventures within America's fledgling NASA. And the rest is Cold War history. Up next, we have Boeing's Model 85321 Quiet Bird. On December 1st, 1977, Lockheed's Have Blue technology demonstrator took off for the first time, making a significant leap toward fielding the aircraft's successor, the F-117 Nighthawk, just a few years later. But more than a decade and a half before Have Blue ever saw a runway, Boeing's largely forgotten Model 85321 Quiet Bird was already making significant strides toward being the world's first operational stealth aircraft. Of course, over the years, there have been a lot of dubious claims about what was the first stealth aircraft. In particular, these days, a lot of people think it was the Horton Ho 229. Now, I had an entire episode of Air Power dedicated to the birth of this myth. It was really born out of a claim made by one of the Horton brothers in the 80s. And despite there being no evidence, those claims were substantiated by a pretty disreputable production company that made an entire documentary acting as though they'd confirmed them. 
Of course, when I put together a video explaining how misleading their documentary was, I immediately got hit by my first copyright strike, levied by that very same production company because I used a clip from one of the commercials for their documentary. Let me know if you guys want me to repost that video with just their clips blurred out because I do think it's an interesting discussion. The truth is, because stealth is a word we use to describe a whole array of technologies, it can be pretty tough to nail down exactly where it started. But Boeing's Quiet Bird effort that began in 1962 likely holds the distinction of being the first aircraft design that prioritized stealth from the onset rather than trying to incorporate stealthy design elements later on down the road, as we saw in platforms like the A-12 and SR-71. Though, to be clear, there are other aircraft competing for that title, and depending on where you draw some lines in the sand, some of them have very reasonable claims. In fact, you could make an argument in favor of another aircraft that we'll talk about later on this list. But while most of these other efforts never made it off the drawing board, the Quiet Bird did exist in a physical sense. In fact, that was sort of the whole deal. You see, the Quiet Bird effort began long before Dennis Overholser at Lockheed Skunk Works would figure out a way to use Soviet mathematician Pyotr Ufimsev's work to calculate a radar return without actually building a design and sticking it in front of a radar array. And as a result, that's exactly what Boeing did. They built their Quiet Bird and stuck it in front of a radar array, and then made changes to design cues or construction materials and stuck it in front of the radar array again to see if it got better or worse. We're talking about a very expensive game of guess and check here. Now, although Boeing's tests did indeed prove promising, the U.S. Army just didn't appreciate the value a stealth aircraft could actually bring to the fight, and the program was ultimately shelved in 1963. If the Army had been more forward-thinking, the Quiet Bird may have offered a low-observable battlefield reconnaissance platform by the late 1960s, kick-starting the stealth revolution more than a decade earlier, and almost certainly changing the way air power has matured in the decades since. But all that effort wasn't for nothing. Boeing would later incorporate design elements they developed with the Quiet Bird into their AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile to great success. Up next is the Convair Kingfish, which didn't make it all that far off the drawing board, but is a very interesting exploration into an alternative for America's legendary SR-71 Blackbird. You see, back when the U-2 spy plane first entered service, Soviet air defenses were already capable of tracking it, and American officials knew that it was just a matter of time before tracking turned into targeting. So the CIA tasked both Convair and Lockheed with developing a new reconnaissance platform that could fly at even higher altitudes and at significantly faster speeds. They also wanted a reduced radar cross-section to minimize the chances of it being shot down. Now, if you're watching this, you probably know that Lockheed would ultimately meet those requirements with their A-12 and subsequent SR-71. But the Kingfish was its primary competitor until then, and today it offers us a very interesting glimpse into what could have been if not for the unrelenting genius and budget-mindedness of Lockheed's legendary aeronautical engineer, Kelly Johnson, who I would contend is the father of modern military aviation. Now, the Kingfish developed out of what remained of Convair's first attempt, known as the First Invisible Super Hustler, or Fish, which all sounds like the name of an unpopular professional wrestler from the 80s. But the use of the word invisible in that acronym also points to why this program also is in contention for being the first intentionally stealth design, even if it didn't make it all that far. The Fish would have been carried aloft by a modified B-58 Hustler before being launched and powered by its own onboard ramjets to speeds in excess of Mach 4. But with concerns about the complexity and cost of this Fish concept, Convair was instructed to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new design built around the Pratt & Whitney J-58 Turbo Ramjet, the same propulsion system that would ultimately power Lockheed's A-12 and SR-71. The resulting Kingfish design was pretty forward-leaning for its time, tucking its two J-58s deep inside the aircraft's angular fuselage to limit the radar return they could produce. And its delta-wing design bore a striking resemblance to the stealth aircraft that would follow decades down the road. But it was also that emphasis on stealth that may have ultimately done the Kingfish in. 
Pentagon officials, spurred in no small part by criticisms from the same Kelly Johnson, feared the Kingfish incorporated too many untested technologies to be built, tested, and operated within the program's assigned budget. Johnson was outspoken in his views that the Kingfish design compromised performance in favor of stealth. Now that's something that was seen as a mistake at the time, despite becoming pretty commonplace in stealth platforms today. Ultimately, Lockheed's proposal won the day, and the Kingfish was relegated to the what-if file. Up next, we have the joint effort from McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics in the A-12 Avenger II, which would have been a stealth fighter on American aircraft carriers all the way back in the 80s. Not to be confused with Lockheed's A-12 from the 1960s, the A-12 Avenger II utilized a flying wing design that was reminiscent of the B-2 Spirit that was in active development at the time, but it was obviously much smaller and came with much sharper angles. In fact, that sharp triangular shape eventually earned the A-12 the nickname Flying Dorito. Now, that A prefix denoted an attack emphasis in this A-12 design, but interestingly enough, it actually would have met the design criteria to be considered a fighter, including an onboard radar array and the ability to leverage a variety of air-to-air -air missiles. As a result, this A-12 with its attack prefix would have been the world's first actual stealth fighter, as the F-117 Nighthawk, which was secretly already in service, had neither onboard radar nor the ability to engage airborne targets outside the realm of hypotheticals discussed on podcasts. That's right, the Air Force's F-117 wasn't really a stealth fighter, but the Navy's A-12 actually would have been. For a while, it really seemed as though the A-12 Avenger 2 program was going off without a hitch, but then, seemingly without warning, it was canceled by Defense Secretary and future Vice President Dick Cheney in January of 1991. It was only later revealed that the A-12 Avenger 2 was way overweight, way over budget, and way behind schedule. It would ultimately take another 26 years to get a stealth fighter onto the Navy's flat tops in the form of the F-35C. Up next is one of the most controversial, and to be honest, one of my favorites, the Boeing 747 CMCA, which would have been the most cost-effective bomber in American history. Back in the 1960s, the U.S. began fielding increasingly capable ICBMs and SLBMs, or submarine-launched ballistic missiles. And with America's defense posture primarily oriented toward deterring Soviet aggression at the time, these new methods of delivering nuclear payloads led to many within both the public and politics to question the need for expensive new bomber programs. And this pervasive line of thought ultimately led to the Carter administration canceling the B-1 bomber program in 1977. Boeing recognized that this cancellation could leave a gap in America's strategic capabilities, so they set to work developing an extremely cost-effective bomber of sorts to meet this need at a much lower price point. The result was the 747 Cruise Missile Carrier Aircraft, or CMCA. Now, this 747 would have been armed with 72 AGM-86 air-launched cruise missiles carried in nine internal rotary launchers, which would have allowed this commercial people carrier to serve as a long-range arsenal ship capable of wiping out targets from 1,500 miles out. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why this might sound crazy, but in truth, it was actually extremely practical in a number of important ways. With an unrefueled range of 6,000 miles, the ability to carry 77,000 pounds of ordnance and pre-existing global infrastructure already established for the 747, this CMCA concept would have produced the most cost-effective bombing platform in modern history. Today, the B-52 Stratofortress costs about $88,000 per hour to fly. The B-2 Spirit rings in at around $150,000, and the B-1B Lancer burns through about $173,000 per hour. But the 747, on the other hand, costs just about $31,000 per hour to fly, and all while carrying a larger payload than any of America's in-service bombers. Of course, this program would never come to fruition, with the Reagan administration pulling the B-1 bomber out of mothballs and the B-2 Spirit entering service shortly 
shortly thereafter. But today, we have seen the US revisit this concept in a way with Rapid Dragon, which is a palletized cruise missile launch system that allows the US to turn its fleets of cargo aircraft into very similar sorts of missile packing arsenal ships. Then, before anybody chimes in to say that it would be irresponsible to use commercial platforms for military service because it could paint a target on commercial aircraft, you should know that there are already a bunch of commercial aircraft in service, including Boeing 707, which is the basis for the KC-135, and the 747 itself, which is the basis for the E-4B National Airborne Operations Center. Up next is the Convair NB-36 Crusader, which would have been a nuclear-powered bomber with near-limitless range. The NB-36 was based directly on the absolutely massive Convair B-36 Peacemaker. And when I say massive, I mean it. You could take one of today's B-52s and lay it on top of the B-36's wings and still have enough room to throw a Super Hornet in for good measure. Thanks to this massive size, the B-36 could carry 86,000 pounds of ordnance, and in the 1950s, maybe at the height of American nuclear hubris, the Air Force experimented with leveraging that massive payload capability to equip this bomber with its own onboard nuclear reactor. The NB-36 carried a one-megawatt air-cooled nuclear power plant that hung on a hook inside its cavernous weapons bay. This reactor then had to be lowered through the bomb bay doors into a shielded underground facility for storage between flights. Now, in theory, a nuclear-powered bomber could literally stay airborne for weeks at a time, if not longer, and could reach any target on the planet without the need to land or refuel. Now today, that may not sound like a pressing priority, but at the time, the U.S. maintained a state of constant readiness for its nuclear bomber fleets to serve as a deterrent against Soviet aggression. In fact, just a few years later, the U.S. would kick off Operation Chrome Dome, which would see nuclear-armed B-52s in the air 24 hours a day for eight straight years. And as you can imagine, this policy was expensive, but it would be a whole lot cheaper if you didn't have to pay for jet fuel. The NB-36's HTRE-3 nuclear reactor would power four GE J-47 nuclear-converted piston engines, each pushing out about 3,800 horsepower. Now, those nuclear engines would be augmented by four additional turbojet engines that ran on good old-fashioned jet fuel so that you could get the aircraft into the air before switching to nuclear power. Obviously, a nuclear-powered engine would work a lot different than an internal combustion one, and this direct cycle system pulled air into the compressor of the turbojet and through a plenum, an intake that led to the core of the reactor, where that air served as coolant. From there, the superheated air would travel into another plenum that led to the turbine section of the engine before exiting as exhaust out the back. Basically, it replaced a jet engine's usual combustion section with a nuclear reactor housed inside the fuselage of the aircraft. Now, the NB-36 really did conduct a series of test flights with its nuclear reactor on board, but always using its jet fuel-powered turbojet engines for propulsion. Ultimately, though, this program was scrapped in 1961 because of the obvious risks inherent to flying a nuclear reactor over literally any populated area. And last but certainly not least, we have Lockheed's X-24C, which would have been a scramjet-powered hypersonic aircraft in service all the way back in the 1960s. These days, buzzwords like hypersonic or scramjet are almost always used in reference to cutting-edge technologies the media acts like the world is still trying to wrap its head around. But the truth is, hypersonic flight and the exotic propulsion systems required to get there have been an active part of American defense efforts for decades. And Lockheed's L-301 program, which led to the unofficially dubbed X-24C, is just one example. This effort would have seen the X-24C carried aloft by the LR-105 rocket engine that was powering the Atlas series of rockets at the time. And in execution, the X-24C would launch in a very similar way to today's hypersonic boost glide weapons. But while those weapons are unpowered during their hypersonic descent, the X-24C came packing a pair of scramjets. These scramjets, or supersonic combustion ramjets, would propel the X-24C to sustain speeds in excess of Mach 6 and peak speeds higher than Mach 8, or around 6,130 miles per hour, 
the aircraft itself resembled the lifting body design leveraged by the Martin Marietta X-24A and B programs that tested unpowered re-entry flight characteristics. In a real way, the L-301 program and its X-24C could be seen as the precursor to ongoing legends about Lockheed Martin's combined cycle turbofan scramjet SR-72, the Air Force Research Laboratory's Mayhem program, and even Hermius's combined cycle turbofan ramjet hypersonic aircraft efforts. Had the X-24C program continued, it would have given the U.S. a scramjet-powered hypersonic aircraft in the 1960s. Of course, instead, the U.S. now appears to still be a few years away at best from fielding a reusable air-breathing hypersonic aircraft. But by the end of 1977, the L-301 program and its X-24C were canceled in favor of a different game-changing military aircraft program, one that would change the value proposition associated with speed for decades to come. That effort, of course, was Have Blue, and the game-changing development that would result was stealth. And it will never not be interesting to me that simple budgetary decisions like this can change the very trajectory of aviation development for the entire planet for years to come. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.